I titled today's message, Don't Try to Fit In. And of course, I'm talking about trying to fit in the world. We are the church, and the church and the world are complete opposites. We are the children of God. We've been redeemed. We've been chosen by God. We've been given new hearts. We've got new minds. We've got a new set of eyes. We are of a different breed. Let's go ahead and pick up where we left off in the book of Proverbs, also known as the book of wisdom. Turn the revelation of God to Proverbs chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Starting there in verse 1, it says this, Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their heart devises violence. And their lips talk of troublemaking. And so we see there that the hearts of the wicked devise or scheme and plot what is evil, right? Their desires are different than our desires because when we came to Christ, we now have a desire to do good. Now we desire to please God. We desire to do what is right. The writer begins by saying, do not. This is not a suggestion. This is a clear command from God, and it's for your own good. Do not be envious of evil men. And I would have you know that all of God's commands are good for us. I remember in my younger years, I didn't always feel that way, to be quite honest with you. When I was a young teenager, and I was becoming more and more acquainted with the Word of God and all of the do nots, but as I grew in the Lord and I began to understand why these commands were here, then I was able to better yield to all that God wanted for me. But in the beginning, it wasn't so. And this is something that we all need to be totally convinced of if we're going to be victorious, if we are going to live victorious lives. We have to be convinced that all of God's commands are good for us. All of God's commands are good for us. There is not one command in the Bible now that bothers me. Because I know God's fatherly heart towards me, right? When you know that these commands are from God and He's the same God who loves us more than our minds can fathom, then all of God's do-nots, we embrace them. I love all of God's commandments. There are still some who see the, the commandments of God as restrictions. Restrictions, like God just doesn't want me to hang out with whoever I want. Like no one's going to tell me who I can and cannot be friends with, you know. Immature Christians think that way. They see everything as just restrictions. But the right way to see God's commands is to see them as protections. Not simply restrictions, but protections. Listen to what King David says about God's loving laws and protective commands. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. We're going to read verses 97 and 98. All of God's do-nots are so good for us. King David says, Oh, how I love your law. When it says law, it's referring to the entire Bible. At that time, it was the Old Testament scriptures. It is my meditation all day long. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. And so King David can say, I love your laws. If God tells King David, King David, I don't want you to envy the evil men of this world. I don't even want you to desire to be with them because their hearts are corrupt. King David will say, I love that law. Whatever it is you want from me, Lord, I love it. And he says there, you through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. So what is the point of all of God's commands, all these commands that are really practical is so that way you would become wise so that you would grow in wisdom so anytime that we yield ourselves to any and every command of God that's when we are growing in wisdom anytime we don't yield to any of the commands of God that's when we are being foolish like King David I to embrace every do not in scripture and so, again, what is the writer 
of Proverbs saying here, he says, do not, in other words, guard your heart and don't go there. Make a concrete choice not to want God, good, or truth haters, what they are or what they have. And so you have to actually make a decision. You, you have to say, you know what, I'm not going to make friends with those who don't know the Lord, those who are going to be a bad influence on my life. You have to make that decision. You have to stand for God. You have to stand for what is right. And you never have to give in to peer pressure, you know, because the one that we want to honor above all is God. Can I get an amen? We have to understand that they are lovers of evil and we are lovers of good. Now, we love the lost, but we don't love what they love. We love what God loves. Don't allow your heart to desire the evil that people are, the evil that people do or the evil that people speak of because you will slip and you will fall like one who walks on a banana peel or on wet ice because the desire of the evil ways of the world is to walk on slippery places or on slippery ground. And if we have enough time, we'll read more about that in Psalm 73 with Asaph. But listen, corrupt desires have the potential to pull you in the wrong direction or put you on the wrong path or connect you to the wrong crowd and place you on shaky ground. And so if you even begin to envy evil men and you desire to be like the world and to be a part of the world and to fit in the world, then you know that there's something wrong with your heart. There is something you're not understanding about this Christian life. There is something you're not understanding about the worth of God and the worth of Christ. There is something you're not understanding about the treasures that you've been given in Jesus Christ if your heart is being pulled by the world and by the people of the world. If you can so easily be in awe of what the world is and what the world has and what the world has to offer, then you have eye problems, you have heart problems, and you need to redirect them back to God. He says here, do not be envious. What does envy mean? Basically means to wish for or strongly desire what another has or is. Or one becomes jealous of another person and or of their possessions. So the Lord is saying, I do not want you to envy wicked people, unsaved people, worldly people, or to become jealous of them, of their accomplishments, of their positions, of their looks, of their talents, of anything that they have. The Lord doesn't want us to be envious of the world in any way or jealous of the world in any way. But he wants us to be content with who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. And I'll tell you, even the little that we have is much more than some of the richest men of the world. And so we are called to be content with who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. The Oxford Dictionary defines envy as a feeling of discontentment or resentful longing aroused or stirred by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck, right? You're just feeling discontent with who you are and what you have, and you just wish that you had what they have, what the world has. The Lord says, don't do that. Do not be envious of evil men. And who are these evil men? This refers to anyone who is up to no good. Just anyone who is up to no good. I mean, we can think of you know, popular people, but it doesn't have to be a popular person. It could be someone down the street, someone in your neighborhood, maybe a, an old friend or a family member or a co-worker. He says here, do not be envious of evil men. This is anyone, and it could be women too, right? Not just men. Men are not the only ones who are up to no good. Sometimes women are up to no good. And so we are to, to avoid their company and if it's evil. Evil men and women are those who are Godless, they are without God in their minds and in their hearts. They just don't have the life of Christ in them. You can hear it when they speak and you can see it when they act. All you got to do is pay attention to their words, their attitudes, lifestyles. And uh, at the very least, they're questionable. At the very worst, they are despicable. And so again, it's a command to not envy 
the evil man, nor desire to be with them, nor desire to be with them. And that's how I got my title for today, Don't Try to Fit In, nor desire to be with them. God is saying, don't desire the way of ungodly men and ungodly women, not the way they are, not the things that they have. And we are not to team up with them at all. Don't follow them in any way, shape, or form. Don't hang out with them. Don't agree with them. And don't partner up with them. And you know, growing up, uh, I gave my life to the Lord around 16, 17 years old. And, and I had to make that call where I had to let go of my friends. And I remember one time they told me, you're going to come back. And you're going to be doing what we've always done. And by the grace of God, it's been over 20 years and I've never gone back. And I never planned to go back. The verse goes on to say, For their hearts devise violence and their lips talk of troublemaking. So that's the reason why you don't hang out with them. You don't partner with them. Why? Because their hearts are corrupt. They devise violence and their lips talk of troublemaking. And as you guys know, we live in a world full of gossips. And you don't want to be a good friend of one who gossips. So you're going to get enveloped and then get to some deep trouble. We're to stay away from people who are up to no good at any level because, again, they have corrupt desires. Their hearts are rotten, and so is their speech. They plan on doing evil things and happily talk about those evil things. And I'm sure some of us are thinking of our BC days, right? It reminds us of who we were before we came to Christ. But there may be some here today that are still tempted to fit in in this world. I'm encouraging you not to do that. It's a given that we should choose our friends wisely because you guys have heard of that old idiom, birds of a feather flock together. And so basically, we're going to become like those whom we chill with, those whom we hang out with, or those that we associate ourselves with. That's a known fact. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 26 says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully. And here's the reason why. For the way of the wicked, or the way of evil men and women, leads them astray. And so again, we have to choose our friends. We have to choose our company. We can't let them choose us. Why? Because we know what's right and we know what's wrong. We know what's good for us. We should know what's not good for us. And so we have to choose friends wisely, especially those of you who are teenagers in this place. Choose your friends wisely. How many professing Christians have not slipped away due to the bad choice of friends and acquaintances. And so we have to choose our friends wisely. And not only should we choose our friends wisely, we should choose our role models wisely too. In one way or another, all of us look up to somebody, right? Everybody has a role model somewhat. And we should choose our music and our music artists wisely too. We should choose social media influencers wisely as well. Because whoever we look to, we will also begin to look like within time and to some degree. You have to understand that everyone that you look to influences you for the good or for the bad. That's the way it works. And so you have to be super and extra careful on what you watch and what you listen to and who you follow. I mean, we live in a, in a day and age where there are tons and tons of influencers, right? And they've got millions and millions of followers. Be careful with who you follow and who you look up to. Be very, very careful. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. The reason why it says don't be deceived is because there are some professing Christians who would say, I can hang out with whoever I want and I'm not going to be affected by it. They think that they're super Christians. You know, I can listen to it whatever I want. I can hear whatever I want, and that stuff is not going to affect me. That's not true. It will affect you. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And so anybody who thinks that way, they think that they can hang out with whoever, especially if that person is up to no good and it's not going to affect you, you are, you are fooled. Growing up as a teenage boy, I chose to hang out with the wrong crowd. And at times, and just like the verse says, they plan to do evil things. I can remember, this verse actually gave me some flashbacks. I look back and I can just imagine my friends hanging out in the room or in the living room and they're talking about 
you know, packing a gun or getting a gun. They're talking about robbing people. They're talking about doing drugs. They're talking about sexual immorality, talking about stealing cars, all of that stuff. And at times I found myself in slippery places. I found myself in some dangerous situations. Why? Because I was hanging out with evil men and I was just like them. I was spiraling downward in my, in my teen years. And it was by the grace of God and the grace of God alone that the Lord rescued me just before I went out of control. And those same evil men that the Bible says don't envy and don't hang out with, a lot of my friends didn't make it. Some are in prison, some are dead, and some are on drugs. And so I know exactly what this verse is talking about, and I know the effects of bad company. I've been there, done that. And sometimes I've been that, right? A bad influence on other people. Again, in my younger years, I also listened to music and artists that had a bad effect on me. Like the verse says, I envied them. I wanted to be like the artist I looked up to. I've shared that with the youth several times. I was impressed by their cool and arrogant attitudes, especially rappers with their chains hanging on their necks, gold chains and diamond rings. I remember as a young man, I, I envied those things. I wanted those things. I craved those things. I wanted their fame. I wanted their popularity. I wanted their raunchy women, their name brand clothing and their fancy cars. And that's what that's talking about. You look at the world and you begin to desire what they have. And we live in a culture right now where people are more like followers than anything. They can raise up a, an artist or good looking woman or whatever and they dress her up and put makeup on her and do certain things to her body and then you have a, a million other little girls who are following in her footsteps. And the same could be said about men. And we are not to follow the world nor the ways of the world. We are to follow Christ. We are to follow what the scripture says. Can I get an amen? amen? And so I've been there. I've envied the wicked. I've wanted to fit in and be just like them. What we have to understand is, even when it comes to music, we're counseled by the lyrics found in music. We're counseled. And a lot of the music I listened to back in the days, it counseled me to do evil things. I mean, there are some, some things I wouldn't even share up here, of the kind of lyrics I used to listen to growing up. And so you have to understand that everything is counseling you to do something. Everything. And you have to ask yourself, what is it counseling me to do? What is it telling me to do? How do they want me to think? How do they want me to act? Right? And so I didn't know then what I know now. And because of that, I fell into the enemy's trap as a young man. This is why I encourage you guys to be super careful with who you pay attention to, who you give your time to, who you give your ears to, who you give your eyes to. Be it an athlete, a music artist, a movie star, a social media influencer, or whatever, because again, their bad ways will rub off on you. Their bad habits will rub off on you, it's a matter of fact. We have to understand that evil influences of all kinds have the potential to shape us. That's what they're doing. They're shaping people's minds and therefore shaping people's lives. And we never want to be clay in the hands of the world, right? We only want to be clay in the hands of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the world does. The world shapes its own. It recreates its own. But we belong to the Lord. Turn your Bibles then to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Remember the command is, do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. Don't desire to fit in with the world. For their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. In other words, they desire to do what God hates. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, he's saying this is the least you can do. After all the mercy that God has lavished on you, the least you can do is honor him with your body. And it goes on to say in verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world. Don't come in agreement or in alignment with the evil ways of this world, don't be molded, don't be shaped by this world, is what that means. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so he's saying, God has been so merciful to you. You shouldn't envy the evil man. You shouldn't want to fit in where you don't belong. Why? Because you now belong to the Lord. You have been bought at a price. You belong to God. You've been called to serve Him, to be a living sacrifice. And that word transformed is the Greek word metamorphosis. There's a change that goes on. And it starts on the inside and you can see it on the outside. You see, God wants to do such a work in your life that people around you can see it. It starts on the inside, it continues on the outside, everyone sees it. It's a transformation. It's a metamorphosis. God truly does a work in our lives. And it says by the renewing of your mind. And so what does the world do? What do evil influences do? They want to corrupt your mind. They want you to think like them. They want you to think like the world. They want you to focus on yourself. But the Bible teaches us that we need our minds renewed. We need our minds renewed. Why? Because everyone lives according to the way they think. You are what you think. Everyone lives according to what they desire, what they want, what they know. And if your mind is renewed by the living Word of God, then you're going to be able to honor the Lord and live in a way that is acceptable in His sight. Can I get an amen? amen? This is why it's important to cultivate good Christian friendships. Right? If you've got good Christian friends, you're not going to find yourself envying the evil man or wanting to hang out with them. Why? Because you're going to be happy with some Christian friends. This way, we do life with people who truly love and fear God, and not those who want to do evil and speak evil. And it's important for us to stay connected. It's important for us to stay connected and get involved with the different ministry meetings that our church provides. As you guys know, we've got youth group, men's group, women's group, and we have these things to keep us strong, to, to keep us connected. And so I just want to encourage you guys to, to really build some strong bridges here and some good friendships here, because if not, we're going to find ourselves tempted to go and find friends in the world and end up doing things we regret. And for those of you who are mature, mature spiritually, those of you who are stronger, I want you guys to set the pace. I want you guys to take the lead and help with this, really helping people connect here in this fellowship. So that way we can continually encourage one another to follow hard after Jesus and not give in to this world that's passing away, right? We need each other. That's why we have these things. That's why we're meeting tonight. We need each other. If we're going to have a strong church, that's what we need. We need to stay plugged in. We need to encourage each other. We need to be there for each other. We need to be able to trust one another and hear one another out, right? And so we need to stay connected as much as possible. We need to be each other's good, godly friends so that way we're not tempted to look outside. And of course, I'm not saying that you can't have an unbelieving friend, you know. You can't win them if we can't befriend some people, right? We just can't be doing what they're doing. We can't be following in their footsteps. We're doing our best to get them to follow in Christ's footsteps as we follow the Lord. And look, you won't find me hanging out with men who are up to no good. I'm not the kind of person who tries to fit in in this world at all. And um, it's only by the grace of God. I try to fit in only in the body of Christ. This is where I belong. And this is where you belong. This is, this is the family that we belong to. You will find me partnering up with men who are intentionally up to doing good. You know where it says there, nor desire to be with them because they got evil hearts. I desire to be with men who have hearts that are renewed, hearts that love God, hearts that love the truth, right? Hearts that love me. And really care about me. And so, you won't see me teaming up with troublemakers. You'll see me teaming up with disciple makers. As I said in the beginning, we are of a different breed. I've told my sons that a handful of times. You have to understand that you have a heavenly identity. You are not of this world. You've been born from above. We are citizens of heaven. Amen? Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 2.9. If you ever forget who you are in Christ, go back to this verse and remind yourself. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation. You are a chosen generation. You've been 
picked by God. Think about that for a moment. You've been selected by the Lord. It says a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That's who you are. You are chosen. You are royal because your God is a king. You are holy because you've been set apart. And why did God do all of this? Not so that you would try to fit in in the world. Not so that you will look up to evil men and women in this world. But so that way you would proclaim the work that God has done in your life. So that you would tell the world how Jesus brought you out of darkness and into his light. That's what it is. And the world needs to hear that. We are not of this world. We are of a different breed. I want you guys to ask yourselves these questions. We're just kind of examining our hearts, examining our lives at this point. What do I watch? What entertains me? What do I listen to? Who do I hang out with? Who do I look up to? Who am I allowing to influence me? Are their words constructive or destructive? Do they help me draw closer to God or do they pull me away from God? And then, do I need to make any changes for my own good and God's glory. And the reality is this, guys, we are always making changes to be more pleasing to God, to be more useful to God, and to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ more. And so it's important for us to really look at our lives and be honest and be sincere about these things and answer them truthfully. And if any changes need to be made, ask God to help you make those changes. All right. I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 73. This is a story of a worship leader who served in the temple, who would be considered spiritually mature and strong in the Lord, who gave in to envy, the envy of the world, and you'll see what he went through. <clears throat> the man's name is Asaph. He's the writer of this, of this psalm. Here's what he writes. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. This is why. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so you can see there, that he was not applying Proverbs 24, 1 and 2. He was envying the boastful. He put his eyes on the prosperity of the wicked. He starts off by saying, God is good, you know, but then he says, but I took my eyes off of that reality and I almost biffed it. Verse 4, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. So at this point, he's in denial. He's forgetting that, that even the world, even those who are rich and powerful and prideful, go through very difficult times. But when he was looking at them, he's like, man, it looks like they have it all good, that they have it all together, but they don't. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? 
Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Now, just for a moment, you can see there that he's really struggling with this. He is saying, man, like, what's the point of following God? If it looks to me like they have a better life than I do. You know, they, they are better off than I am. What's the point of cleansing my heart? All this is, is vain. It's, it's worthless. It's purposeless. This is, where, this is where he was. And so this is a picture of how even a mature believer in Christ can fall into this way of thinking. Verse 15, If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. And so at this point, he's basically saying, man, I cannot believe that I was falling for this, that I was slipping in this way, stumbling in this way. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. There was a turning point in his mind and in his heart. Where did it happen? When he went to God's house. And many times that's where it happens. You come to God's house, you, you experience God's presence, you remember God's goodness, in a song, in a preaching, in a message, in a teaching. The Lord may use a preaching to realign our hearts and minds with God. But it says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Where are we told what is the end of the wicked? In God's house when we open this book, right? And so verse 18 says, surely you set them in slippery places. Remember in verse in verse 2, he says, my steps had nearly slipped. But then he realizes, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Now he's back to reality. Verse 20, as a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. At this point, he's just recognizing, man, I stooped really low. How could I ever compare what I had in you with the things that the world has? He says, man, I became like an animal. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Isn't that beautiful? He's saying eventually I'm going to be with you in heaven. Like why? Why am I jealous? Why am I envious? Why am I trying to fit in in a world that is perishing that you are going to utterly destroy? Verse 25 and then he realizes something so powerful, so beautiful. And this has to happen to all of us. So we get to a place where really God is our everything. I was just sharing this with Blue the other day. I said, Blue, when Christians don't see God as their ultimate treasure, it's because they really don't know God yet. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying they're not loved. They just don't know him. This is what Asaph says in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What a beautiful place to be. To be able to say, you know what? God is my everything. And the world might have nice things. And they might floss the things they have and but the reality is nothing compares to our God. Verse 27, For indeed those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to you, God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. And so again, what is the command? The command is to not be envious of evil men or to desire to be with them. Why? Because their hearts are corrupt. Where should we go? We draw near to God. Isn't that what Asaph says at the bottom? 
it is good for me to draw near to God. Not to draw near to company that's going to corrupt me, but to draw near to company that's going to make me better. And there's no one better than God. Give God praise for his word today.